If you're just joining me, welcome to Wake Up Missoula. We're showing some of the intro to what the uh, uh, school board meeting happened this last Wednesday as the school board are looking to do some major budget cuts as they are dealing with a $5 million, up to $7 million deficit in their upcoming uh, 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 upcoming budget for the July season. Um, eight items. Um, so a uh, big topic in, you know, a lot of the post pandemic money has dried up and now the administration will be making cuts to programs, which include Monte Grease's position as a, the fine arts director. This correlates with a lot of school budget cuts where the arts tend to be targeted because they are always seem to be targeted. Uh, kicking off some um, music for you uh, was that was the Red Wave of Missoula with their, their director uh, put on the special performance to kind of kick off the meeting. Um, I wrote a public comment myself about the uh, fine arts and my, my main takeaway from what I wanted to put in my public comment, which I couldn't actually be there in person, is when I sent the email is that if you're willing to uh, make the cut, then you're willing to get the cut. And this kind of feels like he's uh, um, responding directly to me. The superintendent, Micah Hill, goes into the intro of the budget and some of the cuts and some of the uh, reasoning behind some of the cutting that he's going to be doing. So here he is. And I would apologize to anybody who interpreted that statement as being a, one of don't advocate. That's not my intention. But I literally have people coming to me and saying, get rid of this person or get rid of this thing. Don't touch what's valuable to me. And that is divisive and it hurts and it's not good for our community and it's not good for our staff. We are in a people business, and this is a human endeavor. As we progress through the discussion this evening, on behalf of everyone here, I want to recognize that those impacted by staffing reductions are good people. They have families, they have obligations, and they have deep connections to our community. They are our friends that we love, and they are people who care and love about our students. And I don't know how to say it better than anyone else who's advocating for these positions, that these cuts will have a significant impact on our schools and programs. As a member of the budget committee, I argued that when there are budget reductions, most eyes drift to administration or the central office with commentary that echoes a misunderstood and often misplaced notion that administration is somehow overstaffed. Centralized administration serves to reduce the burden on individual schools and provide for efficiencies that actually reduce costs, increase productivity, and effectively steward a district with over 1,400 full-time employees and almost 10,000 students. They serve teachers in the classroom, they serve students and families directly, they serve programs, and they provide equity and opportunity for those less fortunate. Okay. And so that was the, uh, uh, a big part of the opening statement that uh, Micah Hill, the uh, superintendent for MCPS school systems, which covers roughly about nine, uh, 20 schools in the greater district, which also uh, involves Seeley Lake, uh, way out there for the Seeley Swan High School. Um, I'm definitely one of those people who, who'd cut administrative jobs if it was up to me. However, this is something that shouldn't be off the table, especially since music programs tend to get the biggest cuts. And of course, I'll avoid showing you the back and forth uh, for almost an hour and a half before they actually started to let uh, people in the public uh, talk about this. And Beth Huget, first uh, public comment of the meeting, she's with the business department chair, talks about CTE grant and programming, and talks about her 35 years of experience getting money for MCPS. CTE is known as the high interest area for students. And we have to have our equipment, we have to have our Perkins and our VOED funds what my concern is in this whole process is, because like I said, I'm spanning 35 years, I've been involved in this process, is the decision to take that advance opportunity grant and move that over, that's a one-year grant. You move that over in the general fund, I'm concerned about now, next year, you're gonna have a hole in the general fund because of move shifting that over. So I'm kind of confused on that whole aspect. I would ask that somewhere along the line here, the CTE group could be called in and problem solved the reduction of our CTE coordinator position. That coordinator position is being cut because two years ago we moved that into the advanced opportunity credit. We always paid for that position out of our Perkins funding. We would like to pull that back in. Okay, and that was her uh, 
her public comment on that one as well as we move on to more public comment. Uh, these comments went on and on for some time during the meeting and many departments have to deal with cuts and very little consideration for the current programs and for, for the more modern ones were implemented over the years. Uh, old things tend to get cut over new things and Dustin Hoon, visual arts director, uh, spoke on this a little bit more and this is what uh, he had to say about that. As a dedicated public school teacher, I urge for dialogue and reason, finding a voice in this position's future. I respectfully request that our school board and budget committee reappraise the arts director position. Given its historical gravity, advocacy for teachers, programs, and policies. Over my years with MCPS, this position has been diminished, robbed of powers like curriculum implementation, hiring guidance, and partnerships. Despite the loss of some influence and misunderstandings of the position's historical impact, the fine arts supervisor continues logistics for beloved exhibitions, artistic, theatrical, and musical alike. These community events span generations and transcend administrations, stimulating local businesses. Institutional memory supports this claim. Former and current teachers, community members, administrators, could offer their unique perspectives while you deliberate. Okay. And so, you know, one of the things to argue for a lot of those music programs and art programs in general is that a lot of times these teachers are a through line for a lot of kids during their educational careers at the uh, MCPS school system. Middle school, you have the same band teacher from sixth to eighth grade. High school, you have the same band or, and choir teacher, drama teacher for pretty much uh, from the very beginning to the very end, only in some of the other classes where you uh, essentially would have um, some teachers that do math, but a lot of times when kids have different classes, they have different teachers, but when they s are in more band classes each new year, uh, they have the same teacher to continue on their education moving forward. Um, Heather Adams with the Arts Missoula. Um, Arts Missoula has been a big proponent in uh, helping spark which uh, helps ignite learning, which is part of their slogan and also their mantra in helping uh, artists go into the schools. Back in the 90s, there used to be a program called Artists in the Schools, which uh, would morph in some ways to become the flagship program. Flagship program got cut majorly through just last year. And so this year they're doing with even more cuts. And so here is Heather Adams, uh, the uh, director of Arts Missoula. And we're talking about arts for art's sake, these choir festivals, band, orchestra, art experiences. It's not just about arts integration, that's really important, but in an arts experience, art for art's sake, you're learning about being excellent and resilience. And as Amy Ragsdale said, creating something out of nothing. I think that's what you're trying to do right now, right? You're, you're trying to make this budget work out of not enough resources. This is what a, an experience in the arts actually teaches us. All right, and so that was Heather Adams talking about that. Um, we have Gary Gillette, former um, band teacher for Sentinel High School and has uh, over 40 years of experience uh, in music teaching. And this is what Gary G Gillette had to say. I, there's so much to think about and so many figures and categories. I just implore you to, to remember that it's it's all, it's all comes down to kids. <clears throat> and then we should do everything we possibly can do, like all of us teachers have done for kids, not, not for the budget or the red line or the categories, but to do the best we can for our kids, because it matters. The arts help kids become functioning adults with goals, great thoughts, self-esteem. We know that when something is gone, you, we, we're not gonna get it back. All right, and that was Gary Gillette uh, voicing his concerns about many of the budget cuts and many of the programs that are on the table for this particular thing. And that pretty much uh, does it for my MCPS quotes. It was a five and a half hour meeting, a lot of back and forth, but I wanted to emphasize a lot of the uh, community um, 
coming up to back up mostly the arts programs, but a lot of times uh, for the purposes of the kids. But here's some logistical stuff I wanted to get into. And some many heavy haters of the arts program supported for protecting the fine arts programs the cho um, from the chopping block because MCPS is looking to cut dozens of jobs to make up for the budget shortfalls. The district is facing up to $3 million deficit in general funds and $5 million in ESSER funds, which is federal money, which was provided through the COVID pandemic. Simply being against something doesn't hold off the reality of our education infrastructure that took a hit during the COVID pandemic with money provided through the federal government. And then it basically being cut off and our next fiscal year budget is gonna be in July, which it tends to be after the uh, taxes and property taxes have been put in and evaluated and everything like that. Not to mention we're dealing with a major uh, property tax hike and so the uh, this MCPS is looking for potentially uh, putting up levies in, in May to see whether or not uh, the uh, citizens of Missoula are willing to pay a little bit extra to uh, support these schools moving forward, especially with all, a lot of these programming. So we're going to move on and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of city council, which wasn't much. There was about a 35 minute meeting. They voted to approve 14 trucks for police officers, uh, appointments to boards, bills being paid, budget stuff. Uh, but I did want to get into uh, another meeting that they talked about, which was the Lyling Student Planning Meeting, which I don't actually have any clips on this one. I actually cut this uh, particular topic, but I wanted to uh, mention it as well because Daniel Carlino, City Council, brought up a topic that he essentially wanted to uh, uh, emphasize the use of having cafes in little uh, cute little cafes and um, residential slash commercial mixed use uh, residency so it's easier for access and then a lot of the uh, council members and staff uh, rebuked him and basically said that a part of the uh, rezoning code that they've been starting since 2018 a big chunk of that had to do with the fact that uh, they already are doing it plus uh, additional funds like a food mart you know just stop in shops and those kind of things just to kind of enhance a traditionally suburban but also has the component of having a mixed use which is one of the major things that are happening especially when you're so close to the downtown metropolitan area um, just to help reduce congestion and travel to some of these uh, amenities and just having more mixed use that's essentially what this meeting boiled down to so we're going to move on we're going to go into public safety and health one of the uh, many uh, committee meetings that the city hosts on Wednesdays in the uh, early morning to the afternoon um, talks about the title five in the world of Airbnbs. So Airbnbs, short-term rental properties, this is for harsher regulations and requirements for homes to get registered before uh, operating as those short-term rentals. And so they do have like a 180 day grace period. So there's isn't like uh, when people start Airbnb, but there's also not that many people on staff that are uh, actively making sure that people are keeping up with the Airbnb. And Stacey Anderson, City Council, talks about the requirements for short-term rentals. And this is what she had to say. tourist homes. That process is still the same that's laid out in Title 20. They also have to go through a, a process that's laid out in the state having to do with the health department. None of that is changing. It's just the requirement that the um, list, the license number be listed. Where the change that this ordinance actually comes into, kind of brings to the overall system is creating a licensing process for short-term rentals that are owner-occupied that we really hadn't necessarily had um, a licensing requirement before and so I think CPDI is working to figure out you know they don't have to go through as a stringent of a review process or an inspection process because they are not they are owner occupied and so the theory is it's like if you are willing to let you and your family live in that house like you know there's probably a certain level of a threshold and so um, kind of with out trying to get too specific within this title 5 change how that office is going to take um, that do that permitting process, it allows for internal um, CPDI staff to kind of create that based on when you come in for a license saying, hi, this is what I'm licensing, a permanent tourist home that I do not live in versus I'm going away on sabbatical and want to rent my house out for three months. So, All right, so a big chunk of that had to do with just like logistics between, you know, people who want to turn theirs into an Airbnb, which for, you know, as for people who do want to do like Airbnb type stuff, it's essentially as easy as just downloading an app and getting registered and all that kind of stuff. But the city is getting a little bit more harder on uh, some of these uh, more short term rental places um, for permitting purposes. The ordinance would go so far as to find bad, uh, find bad actors in the process. And most city ordinances, you can't go to jail for any of these ordinances. Just so you guys know, these are just fees on fees on fees and all that kind of stuff. Not to mention the uh, 
uh, Ryan Sidsbury did talk about the uh, rental. I don't know if he actually said this, but um, so the part of this was to have the 180 day grace period. Uh, permanent short term rentals will have to abide for sure, but wiggle room for renting your home over the summer might be a little bit different unless uh, listed as an Airbnb short term rental. It's it, it really just depends. And sometimes property owners just do like more word of mouth than uh, just go through the whole process of just uh, commercially renting out. But then that doesn't technically constitute as commercial because it's very much just like word of mouth and you're kind of renting to somebody that you know. It's it's kind of weird how it uh, you can get into the legal uh, um, wormhole uh, <laughs> that is this, but the city is not uh, in the market to police these. Uh, but like sidewalks, if enough people complain and most mostly people have to self-police in these particular circumstances, Aaron Pian explains the situation and there's current quote unquote bad actors. And this is what Aaron Pian had to say about that. I, I think we're going to need some patience from council and the community and others at the initial start. Um, we know we have over 260 uh, tourist homes in the community today that are not compliant with our registration. And so it's not just a matter of, of those that are already registered posting their registration and then looking at this new category or criteria of owner occupied and creating a tiered system to provide them a registration number we have to bring a lot of tourist homes into the current registration process before they'll be able to post their registration number and be in compliance with uh, these new title five uh, amendments should they pass and so all right so we'll leave that there uh we'll uh, move on to uh housing redevelopment and community programs. And so far, this is kind of like an ongoing thing. Uh, they haven't had those uh, uh, official meetings. These, these are more just like community meetings are not necessarily not m m policies get kind of moved along to the Monday night, night, my, Monday night meeting for when they get finalized. And so we won't know for sure if this is going to be continuing or if they're going to um, vote on it. But definitely there is not going to be a city council meeting next Monday because of President's Day. Just wanted to let you guys know. I'll probably remind you guys at the end of the show. But Housing Redevelopment and Community Programs is doing something big with Missoula Redevelopment Agency, which would require a vote by the city on any items more than $50,000. And this is a Daniel Carlino uh, brought this particular uh, uh, item up and he uh, here he is talking about the reasoning behind um, having additional city vote oversight. Missoula worried about their property taxes increase increasing and um, the MRA has a bucket of millions of dollars a year that is being spent of Missoula taxpayer funds and I believe that Missoula Missoula voters should be able to vote in the people um, who spend their tax money and um, they should be able to vote them in or vote them out if they do not like how their tax money is being spent. Um, All right. And so that was Daniel Carlino's reasoning behind adding that uh, um, function as a way for uh, moving forward with a lot of these uh, Missouri development uh, developments moving forward. Of course, this does remind me of the state law that required the city take action on land use and planning as planning board had the similar powers to, uh, to uh, change and modify development standards in those areas. Uh, much to the uh, um, beh behoof of the city. Uh, of course, that did change, and the city had to update and be a little bit more on the ball when it comes to zoning and planning, which if you've ever seen some of the city council members as they go a little bit further into detail about certain land and property development type stuff, that's very much looks like what the planning board used to do for the most part. Planning board is more of an advisory board now. They did have some major sway, but state law kind of changed that over the last couple of years. Uh, Alan Buchanan, MRA talks uh, more on um, uh, in response to this particular um, um, provision that Daniel Kalina wants to add. And this is Ellen Buchanan talking about, uh, she's the director of MRA. It does not act in a, in a vacuum. Um, there have been a number of, a number of responsibilities that the city council over the years has assigned to the MRA board and they are generally those things that are called out in state law as being eligible for expenditure of tax increment dollars such as improvements in the public right-of-way removal of blight those sorts of things and and it's I mean the, the agency and the board were established in 1978 and it has worked well for Missoula. I don't know that this structure would work well for every city. I don't know that the structures used in other cities would work well for us. But this is certainly seems to have served the city well, and I think you just have to walk around the downtown to, 
to see a really, really good example of, of tax increment at work in a very efficient manner. And for, you know, just a little bit more of a history, tax increment financing, uh, urban rede redevelopment districts, a lot of those kind of money that have already been put aside for these particular projects moving forward. Not to mention uh, the whole, uh, the main point of um, Missoula Redevelopment Agency was the whole purpose of mitigating blight, um, leveraging some tax money. Not to mention it was very much like how a lot of people would call it uh, corporate welfare. There's just a lot of different things about the complicated structure of taxes as it pertains to uh, completed projects as Alan Buchanan continues a little bit further on this topic as well. Is that I think a lot of people maybe don't understand because the property tax system in the state of Montana sometimes defies understanding um, is that residential properties are taxed at a much lower rate than commercial properties. Um, and even multifamily pro projects in the state of Montana are taxed as residential, even though every one of them is a business. Um, so you don't get the tax generation from residential projects, and you certainly don't with the projects like Bellagio that aren't on the tax rolls. And those are the types of projects that we've used TIF dollars to support for the history of, of the redevelopment agency. I mean, we've got, we, we have $1.3 million in Bellagio. There would have been probably a third of those units lost had it not been for the infusion of TIF money in that and our ability to do that. It's not going to return a nickel in increment or, or be on the tax rolls when that district uh, sunsets, but we're providing housing for 200 people that didn't have a roof over their head or a, a, a decent roof over their head potentially. So. All right. And so some of the reasoning behind a lot of these programs was to help bolster development in, in the first place. A lot of this uh, TIF money could also was used in the past to um, <coughs> increase the amount of units like in, in the Bellagio, but also increase units in various other projects throughout the city as well. Um, there is a redevelopment. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things happening um, just in the city of Missoula, a lot of affordable housing, a lot of different things moving forward. <coughs> of course, last year, the Trinity Apartments were uh, one of the major uh, steps uh, for the city of Missoula to operate and um, basically manage a major uh, affordable housing unit complex. Um, and then we're going to take this as a way to uh, transition into another uh, topic in the Housing Redevelopment Agency, um, where the redevelopment there is also an update for the mid-fiscal year of 2024 homeless programs. Emily Armstrong from the Housing Community Planning talks Johnson Street Shelter, and this is what she had to say about that. The purpose of this contract is to have the contractor provide emergency, emergency shelter services at the Johnson Street Shelter facility, including activities related to new and ongoing programming to provide additional emergency sheltering services in our community. The time period for this is August of 23 to September of 2024. The contract does, is to not exceed $789,345. The funding source for this contract is the American Rescue Plan Act. And I will also add that this um, project is a partnership with Missoula County, and they also provide funding towards the emergency shelter uh, and do, do so through their own public process. All right, so that was Emily Armstrong. Oh, sorry, I'm on, I'm having a coughing fit, but I got to keep moving forward uh, through these topics. But if you look closely, uh, the Johnson Street Shelter will only be funded through September 2024 and might go back to a winter only shelter, but still the site has been argued back and forth by residents in the area nearby who are worried about the permanence of this shelter. And so far, 480 individual, 480 individual people have tapped this resource with a range of 26 to 145 people at any given night. Um, police Chief Mike Collier talks more on this and about what some of the efforts have been um, in this particular area and some of the updates on what the police presence has been in the area. If we're looking at um, recidivism as far as an actual towards the slant streets, um, for the time period of September through December, they had 31 calls for service within 1,000 feet of that intersection. And when I look through the types of calls for service, they're, they're really kind of benign. You know, things like... Um, Suspicious activity, abandoned vehicles, uh, extra patrols, and follow-up, that type of stuff. The only ones that are really look linked specific, there's an unattended death, there's a, a traffic stop and a theft and a stolen vehicle. 
and just dis one disorderly conduct. So it's much, much lower calls for service and seems to be much less criminal, you know, nexus. Yeah. So essentially, uh, there are definitely a lot of people around the area that uh, may or may not have made the residents in the particular area uncomfortable, but my color is uh, assured that a lot of the calls that were to the police station haven't been um, uh, showing any kind of major red flags. Um, Emily Armstrong, Housing and Community Plan, talks about the uh, Built for Zero program, which is a two-year program worth $190,000 worth of grants and is uh, uh, key to kick in this, this year and continue on for uh, building towards a zero-capacity zero building. So this is what uh, Emily had to say about this. For Built for Zero, which is a larger group of um, partners and providers, larger than that core improvement team, was formed in November of 2023 at that um, on site learning session that I mentioned previously. And through the formation of that, we now have 35 members from 25 organizations on that coalition. And in, just in January, a few weeks ago, we held our second coalition meeting, um, and that meeting had 26 attendees from 14 organizations. And then we're also working with Built for Zero coaches already to begin crafting tools that will help us track progress towards our community aim and the breakdown of goals and milestones to achieve that aim. And as a reminder, that aim is to achieve functional zero for veterans, houselessness by Veterans Day in 2026. All right. <coughs> so that was the uh, part of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of money through grants that the city is looking towards, which Emily talks about the Trinity Department, which is one of the many uh, facilitators for uh, housing. And so this is kind of, uh, you know, their summary of the Trinity Navigation since it's going on their first year since they opened up. The goal of this project is that we work with the community with our community partners to offer a service model that provides access to the Missoula Coordinated Entry System, housing navigation, behavioral health support, and other resources for neighbors who are unhoused. The status is that we are working with Homeward, Missoula Housing Authority, and Blue Line Development, and a number of other community partners to identify an operational lead and secure funding for startup costs and ongoing operations. Those two pieces have been the key challenge in this project, and we continue to work with partners to try to solve for um, provider capacity to operate the space and then seek funding um, through a number of different sources to make that possible. And kind of going back into the uh, the grant that they were able to achieve was the you know of course the hundred and ninety thousand dollar grant that for their uh, zero uh, uh, housing project that they're trying to figure out is that they're trying to b build a bridge between a lot of these different organizations to basically help get people to have a through line into providing easier access to other points of access because um, a lot of times you know when you are homeless and you uh, you don't have a lot of you know like you carry everything that you've ever had or ever will have on your back or in your vehicle if you're just in a vehicle and you know overall this program is city-led and it's going to coordinate with other groups that are a wider reaching than Operation Shelter which was a city county coordination during the pandemic which was called Operation Shelter which technically ended at uh, with w that one vote a couple years back when they wanted to get some extra funding for their operation shelter, which also included the uh, mobile crisis unit moving forward, which unfortunately it did, lo it did lose and, and the voters voted against it. It was also during a time in which a lot of people were really feeling the stress from the post-pandemic era in which a lot of people were uh, dealing with higher inflation, property taxes were kicking into gear. And yeah, it was just not a good time for people to ask, especially the city to ask for more money from the community in terms of this. So there's definitely a lot of things happening here as well. And you know, not, you know, Anna mentioned uh, in this also, uh, uh, the, the, you know, pretty thick city slash school board report. Honestly, I went half an hour just kind of talking back and forth about a lot of these clips and a lot of the things. So I'm gonna take it on, I'm gonna, put it on over to some of the promos and some of the new programs going to be airing on MCAT with a couple of the uh, promotional commercials for our uh, summer camps and our Saturday drop-ins uh, and more. So without further ado, here's, uh, here's a little taste of what you missed this week on MCAT television that are all now available on our YouTube page. <laughs>
Yeah, so, you know, bears. They're spreading weeds. They're little rascals. Um, but they're kind of everywhere, right? They're, they're all over the place. They're not suffering from malnutrition. Um, that bear is an absolutely gigantic <laughs> bear, um, also covered in, in hound's tongue. Um, also, I thought it was neat. We found a bunch of collared bears. So we, t we captured images of collared bears. So Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is trying to keep track of where these bears are, what they're doing, when do they hibernate, where do they hibernate. Uh, and so we found all kinds of images of collared bears also. Um, so bears, yeah. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> we got lots of them. We have no uh, dearth of bears. Sort of go, okay, I start from a kind of bold, quick, fast <laughs> imagery to getting more and more complicated. And so I'm going to stop with that for now and just say this is number 13. So when I first came up with the series, I just came up with a number. I was like, okay, I'll do 27 of these. Do 27. So by the time you get to 13, I had actually been producing quite a bit. I had showed uh, the work at the Noyce Gallery in Kalispell. That was the first time I showed any of the work um, and, and was kind of enjoying it. So the deal with these is they were never for sale individually. It was definitely that they were a quartet. They had to do with the simplicity of the form and using the form to sort of describe these different elements that Empedocles, who was a Greek philosopher artist who lived in Sicily. I have come here to serve you. All right, it's time for that middle of the show um, pre-critic where I pre-judge a movie based on uh, all my pre-biases when it comes to most movies in general these days. These movies aren't as good as these days as those days that I remember through my dumb kid eyes. Uh, we're going to kick things off with a superhero movie, which is more of like a thriller slash uh, um, uh, Terminator-esque kind of thing. So in the vein of keeping the movie rights to Spider-Man based uh, characters comes Madam Web, which not only has w not one, not two, not three, but a, a roughly around four to five uh, Spider people just kind of chilling in the city of New York and possibly Boston from what I heard. Enjoy a series that takes itself too seriously with four spider women taking on a Terminator style type spider guy who is hell bent on changing the future with uh, where the good Spider-Man is. Something tells me that the final fight will have Madame Web blinded, but her powers let her see more than her eyes were preventing from seeing. Uh, some stuff like that. So enjoy your, uh, your kind of like thriller kind of movie thing that uh, the writers of Morbius are also on. So just to give you a, a, a glimpse. Uh, Bob Marley, One Love. When I think of One Love, there might be uh, one person who loves this movie. Enjoy yet another biopic of weed smoking Jamaican on his journey just to have a good time and make good music. This movie uh, will p try to paint him as a figure of great influence to many college kids posters who have dropped out or will drop out of college. Bar Marley never took himself too seriously but advocated for cannabis use or ganja as he called it in his Rastafarian beliefs. The same beliefs that basically got him killed because he didn't want to amputate his toe that, was be that became cancerous and then he just died because because he didn't believe in, um, you know, medicine. Anyways, Adam the First, uh, basically a cross-country journey to find some 14-year-old uh, birth father. Something tells me it won't end like Mamma Mia. The guy from X-Files is in this drama uh, who decided to uh, throw his hat in with uh, some of the uh, producers here in the state of Montana. So here, this is a little bit of uh, a uh, thing from uh, Novo Vento, which is a organization uh, producing uh, 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 
production firm here in Montana that produces a lot of these kind of things and this is very much like a super indie film so but I'm pretty sure the poster kind of spoils who's this guy's daddy is and I'm pretty sure it's uh, uh, the guy from the X-Files who played Mulder um, David Duchovny I know his name I'm just saying it all right so that concludes a uh, pre-critic for you guys I have a new dub and stuff from the um, 1948 uh, Humphrey Bogart film uh, Key Largo so Without further ado, here's this, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some events. La, 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 la. Oh, I wasn't uh, ready for my entrance, but uh, here I am anyways. I can tell by everyone's uncomfortable silence that you are all expecting me. The boss will be out shortly. Just uh, hang tight. Oh, wow. A gangster-themed party? This is just so... Oh. Hi, Denise. What's going on over here? Filing and more filing. Aren't you a little bit pretty and young to be worrying about tax? Um, excuse you. Oh, have you thought about, you know, not doing taxes? I don't think you can do that. Oh, Johnson. They call me Booker. Make sure you get everyone's W-2s, um, in kind order, of course, if you don't mind. Oh, um, could I have one of those things? Yeah, sure. You know, the shorter my life, the less taxes I have to pay. Oh, uh, is that what they say? Uh, you gotta worry about the estate tax. Ugh, even in death, I can't get my money. Huh. What's the deal with this guy, anyways? He was just audited. Oh, and, uh... Who are these guys? Uh, maybe I should, uh, be getting on out of here. You know, I have, uh, you know... Church, late night church, midnight mass kind of service. Um, you know, just, uh... Kind of chilling out, not doing too much. Hey, are you guys with, uh... Let's just say we're from Cincinnati. Oh, that's not, uh, that's, uh, that's not really much of an upgrade. But I'll accept it anyways. Um, let me see here if I can find some money for you guys. Here uh, you go. Receipts only. Uh, what? What are you, some kind of barbarians? Ugh, that deli meat's giving me the vapors. Uh, in accounting school, they don't teach you how to tie a tie, so you just gotta kind of... Or from the school of hard knocks. Oh. You guys still here? You kind of, kind of declare your pets or something like that? I already audited you, so why don't you just get on out of here? Um, don't let this jewelry just fool you. I'm actually quite poor, so, uh. um... Oh, yes. I know the type. <laughs> you sure showed him, boss. <laughs> uh, sorry. Huh, we're professionals. We're here to do a job. And then get up on out of here. All these profitable tax services. Hmm. They're not quite here to help. I donated some clothes to Goodwill. Is that good enough for you? <laughs> you have to file that for next year's tax plan. Well, I did just think of a couple things for this year's tax season. Oh, there's a storm. The tax season's canceled. Let's go home. Just another friendly reminder that uh, tax deadline is April 15th. Uh, I don't think we're going to get an extension to about to June like we did during the pandemic. So um, I don't know why I keep on <laughs> reference to the pandemic, but regardless of that, we're going to move on over to some events that are happening within the city of Missoula. If you're interested in doing going out and about today, um, Excel Learning Level 2, uh, Lifelong Learning Center. I always like to uh, emphasize their courses and some of their uh, classes that they do is kind of like pay per class, but then you get certified in many things like Excel 2. And this is a offering at the uh, the Excel uh, at the Lifelong Learning Center. Uh, Stroller Strides, Mommy and Me workout classes. If you're a mother uh, looking to get outdoors and work out and some stuff, they meet at Bonner Park around 9.30 a.m. Uh, to do some Stroller Strides. Indoor Fun, Mismo and YMCA, uh, Roots Acro Sports Center are many of those uh, examples of where you can uh, stay active but also staying indoors, especially during this cold weekend. Uh, Mizzoud Food Bank, meal distribution from 10 to about 1 today. Um, uh, two, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays they have of a larger, uh, wider uh, window from 10 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Uh, but today they're going to be open until 1 p.m. and they are a wonderful resource for people who want um, 
to uh, not break the bank when it comes to buying food. Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium, they have their open hours. Uh, they're starting uh, to have regular hours at the Missoula Insectarium. I totally uh, recommend checking them out. And they're uh, around 10 a.m. Um, they're open uh, most days. Uh, Tiny Tales and Storytime, as always, this is a free event here at the Missoula Public Library to, in, um, to uh, give uh, kids the access for reading and books that they uh, could use. Um, I don't know, I'm just kind of making things up off the top of my hand, but um, they're doing that every single Friday, 10.30 a.m. on the second floor. Lunch service at the Pav and Senior Center. If the Pavarella Center uh, does regular lunch, breakfast, and dinners, Senior Center uh, does this mostly at uh, 11.30 a.m. Um, every uh, day, Monday through Friday, um, at the Missoula Senior Center. And you can go check out the Pavarella Center as well for uh, their uh, lunch um, time deals. Um, <coughs> Yarns and Watercolor at the Missoula Public Library, 12 noon, like it is every single Friday. John Philaritis is going to be at the Old Post starting at 12 noon today, so if you're interested in going to get some music and lunch, Old Post is the place to be. Hands-on Science, all about anatomy, Spectrum Discovery Center, uh, Discovery Bench on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library. They do these regular science-based uh, activities, two in the afternoons, most days, Tuesdays through Saturdays from about 10 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Uh, Lego Club at 2.30 p.m. Uh, this is an ongoing thing for kids to uh, just play with Legos. It's pretty simplistic. Uh, Young Adults Writers Group uh, also has this recurrent event every Friday at 3.30 p.m. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons Guild for Adults, 6 p.m. It's online through uh, Missoula Public Library. And then once we start going out and about tonight, there are also some options for parents. Zoo Town Church is hosting a kids drop off and parents go out night. Um, uh, and so you can drop off your kids, pay a fee, and then you have them, uh, basically the kids uh, looked after for about until 10 p.m. while you go out and about to many of these other events that are happening in the downtown Missoula area, which starts with Zach Reed Morrison is going to be at Imagination Brewing Company doing some acoustic type jam music. Uh, winter prep pep rally, so this is a big deal for the uh, University of Montana's basketball team as they're doing a pep rally at 6.30 p.m. tonight at the Oval. Uh, Marjorie Cates is going to be at Cranky Sand Public House. I cannot say en enough great things about Marjorie Cates and her voice. Um, she'll be playing at, uh, singing at Cranky Sand Public House starting at 7 p.m. tonight. Valentine's Square Dance at Free Cycles. They're doing a Valentine's Square Dance tonight uh, featuring folk music at 7 p.m. Um, Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. So that's a big deal happening. So this is the kickoff event this weekend. It's going to go on all through next week. They're going to be doing a lot of doc shops in the Missoula Public Library, but they're going to be opening with the 399 Queen of 10 Tons, and they'll be at various locations from the Missoula uh, Public Library, Wilma Theater, which is where they're having the kickoff, um, Zootown Arts Community Center, Missoula Children's Theater, and I saw plenty of doc shops that would be hosting at the Missoula Public Library as well this week. You can go to Big Sky Documentary Film Festival.org for more information. Um, and also happening Friday night, if you're going late, late night, Copper Mountain Band is going to be at the Sunrise Saloon playing some country music to wrap up your Saturday night. Uh, Friday night, sorry. <sighs> now we're going on to Saturday because uh, Saturday you're doing some markets and such. If you are uh, in the market for going to the winter market and getting that farmer's market kick, you can go to the Southgate Mall every Saturday from about 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Orchard Homes it just started doing their winter market. And uh, if you haven't seen the sign on the road, uh, they haven't been putting it on MissoulaEvents.net, so I haven't been able to know exactly when the Orchard Homes does it. But Orchard Homes is just off of 3rd uh, Street, just as you're going past uh, Reserve. So if you go down 3rd, like you're going to Wheat, Montana, and you look to your left, there is a little marketplace there called Orchard Homes. Uh, if you're uh, interested in doing your taxes and having uh, some tax prep through the University of Montana. This is an ongoing thing every single Saturday at 8.30 a.m. And you must make less than $60,000 uh, a year, which is most Missoulians. So you won't be able to have any problems with that. And they, it's going to be at the University of Montana. You can find out more information by going to MissoulaEvents.net. All right, further down the line, they're doing some therapy dogs at the Missoula Public Library meet and greet. And this is, uh, uh, this is very... Uh, Reminiscence of what the, uh, the library did with read dogs, in which you know they re do a reading with their therapy dogs. Heartthrob 5K Target Range School is doing an 80s very colorful theme, uh, starting at 8, uh, 10 a.m. at Target Range School, and they're doing their annual Heartthrob 5K run. 
women-led uh, plumbing workshop. Home Resource Community Room is doing a, this is the home resource, um, just off of uh, Russell Street. At, starting at 10 a.m., they're doing a women-led plumbing workshop. If you're interested in learning how to plumb, this is the community workshop for you as well. And I just recently learned that apparently you can just use dish soap instead of uh, um, uh, plumbing, um, the plumbing formula. Uh, to clear out your uh, clogs because essentially all you have to do is just put the uh, drain uh, uh, the uh, dish soap down the drain let it set for the same amount of time you do anything else and just uh, uh, fill it up with some hot water because it already expands as is and so that really would definitely help people clear out some clogs on their drains if you think just think about it um, Missoula uh, Museum Tour at the Missoula Art Museum this is every single Saturday at um, 11 a.m. this is a museum tour uh, by the Missoula Art Museum. Uh, Storytelling at Traveler's Rest is going to be featuring Elder Lucy Vanderberg, and they do this every Saturday at uh, 11 a.m. at the Traveler's Rest State Park in Lolo, Montana. Um, um, MCAT Saturday drop-ins, this is a, a recurring event that happens every single Saturday at 1 p.m. here in our studio, where I am right now. Um, first reads, Zoe's Perfect Wedding by Matthew Lopez. This is a, a play, going to be featured uh, at... Um, well, it didn't even say where it was. Oops. Uh, I believe this is going to be at the Zach. And saying I do is the easy part, but the hilarious commentary on commitment is every bride's worst nightmare disaster after disaster falls, follows her down the aisle from brutal, brutally honest, boozy speeches to totally incompetent wedding planning. And so this is uh, essentially the first reads directed by J.M. Christensen. And you can check this out starting at 2 p.m. at the, uh, ooh, darn. Let's see. Actually, I'm just going to look this up real quick because it's, it's bothering me that I don't know. Um, 2 p.m. Just bear with me. <laughs> oh, it's at Missoula Public Library. So it's going to literally be here. I don't know why I didn't even mention it at the Missoula Public Library, but it'll be here on the, uh, Coop, in the Cooper Room. And it'll be just doing a first read, and so it's just a nice little read through. I don't think there'll be much like acting in terms of physical presence, but it's mostly just like from reading from the book. Hedwig and the Angry Inch. The West Side Theater is continuing their play that is, uh, has been happening the last two weekends, and you'll be uh, doing a show at two in the afternoon at the West Side Theater. Way Down North is going to be playing folk music at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. Wolf and the Moons at Draftworks starting at 6 p.m. doing a jam band. Midsummer Night's Dream, one of Shakespeare's uh, popular up, uplifting plays uh, from way back when, uh, starting at 7.30 p.m. Uh, tonight, and it's going to go on until the 25th of of February, so you have the rest of the month to check it out and do an unforgettable tale of misplaced affection, supernatural mischief, and compounding happy ending. A Minnesota Business Night Dream is an ode to, to love, nature, loyalty, and the sheer magic of words. Jazz Night is happening at Stave and Hoop starting at 8 p.m. Uh, karaoke at the Westside Lanes and Fun Center at 9 p.m. <laughs> Nashville 406 is going to be the Sunrise Saloon playing some country music at 9.30 p.m. And then Chris Moon is going to wrap up your Saturday at 10 p.m. And so those are pretty much all your events and everything that you need to know. I also did want to do uh, one last thing, and I wanted to uh, show off a, um, let's see, let's just make sure you don't, uh, before I talk more about different things, I also wanted to mention that uh, the city of Missoula, um, also uh, did a City Club, and I wanted to kind of show a little bit from excerpts from that before I continue on, and it had a lot to do with the fact that um, um, bridges in Missoula are in trouble, and uh, there's not much money going towards it, and so this had to do with the fact that um, McClay Br Bridge closed in January, and so this is a big, uh, a big part of this is the reaction to it as well. And so here is um, folks from the City Club, and this is now available on MCAT's YouTube page right now. And to replacing McClay Bridge. Um, we had a fair amount of almost activity around 2015-2016 uh, when the county decided to back away from the project. Um, interestingly, at the time, in 2003, we estimated that there were about 22,000 vehicles a day going past what's now the Blue Mountain intersection um, on Highway 93. And they anticipated that by 2025, that was going to grow to 29,000 vehicles a day. And if we put the bridge in there, it would bump up to about 36,000 vehicles if we had uh, Linda Vista traffic coming out through that space. In fact, we just looked this up. The 2022 count for
for the Blue Mountain intersection on Highway 93 is 33,000 vehicles a day. <laughs> so on the one hand, we're getting pretty close. On the other hand, we're doing that much without a bridge either place there. We closed the bridge to school buses in 2020 because we were seeing too many holes there. At the time, it was recommended to handle about 100 vehicles a day. It was getting about 2,610 a day in 2010. Um, at the time, fire trucks were allowed to go over it once for an emergency at five miles an hour, and they had to come back a different route. <laughs> All right, and so there's gives you the scope of how hard it is to get services up to Blue Mountain from McClay Bridge, which was built back in 1956, has been done many, many patchworks, many uh, new projects were up on the horizon, but many of the residents up in the target range said no. And a lot of times uh, that was a, there was a lot of outcry from the people up in target range who would rather just see nothing happen and just keep things the way they are than uh, having the reality that is now in which McClay Bridge not only is not allowing pedestrians on bridge, but not even the cars that are originally on the McClay Bridge. So there's definitely a lot of things happening um, in this particular case, and City Club goes further into uh, details. I mean, I didn't even know that uh, Missoula as a whole had uh, over 60 bridges that are, that are larger than 20 feet, and over 60 bridges that are under 20 feet, and over 130 bridges that are just would be count as just typical bridges over streams or just little areas in which they count it. So there's, there's definitely an interesting uh, a tidbit I wanted to go into. And that would have been included with my promos for uh, my videos at the beginning of the show. But um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, add it into the fold before this morning. But I also wanted to highlight that uh, particular city club because they do, uh, I think it is honestly one of the main sources of um, Many of the main issues that are happening here locally, in which the city of Missoula brings a lot of the uh, folks to a luncheon, and then they talk about some of the topics and some of the issues while also bringing in experts to talk about these topics as well. And, you know, um, and as we get further towards the end of my show, I wanted to talk about some news tidbits happening around the city of Missoula. Uh, sunrise, sunset, as my boss says, as many stores are closing in Missoula, and Missoula Current brought up some better news for businesses opening the Southgate Mall. Hobby Lobby, which essentially taken over for former Lucky's Market and various businesses, which also included Mount Mary Mary's Mountain Cookies, opening up in the Southgate Mall with downtown rentals. You, you know, with downtown rentals, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, also, more Julie stro stores that are gonna be near the new Texas-themed restaurant, the Texas Roadhouse, one that was basically built across from Red Robin, which essentially is where the uh, only uh, escalator in the Southgate Mall, and I believe the whole entire city uh, uh, in terms of escalators, besides, of course, the airport. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of things happening as well. And I also wanted to mention, go back and cover a little bit more of the MCPS's story about their budget uh, cuts. Uh, when a lot of the pandemic with the funds were there to help schools would not be there resulting in that $3 million deficit. And overall shortfalls includes $5 million in loss in COVID relief funds. Um, not to mention that additional $3 million deficit um, sans um, COVID money. So there's a lot of money that's not going in there as well. And the, both the Missoula Art Museum and Combs, um, wait, wait, M both the Missoula Art Museum and John Combs sees the benefits of keeping art programs in the school. John Combs used to be the foreign arts director for MCPS. And this is what they had to say is that, quote, the people in this community care about it and we want our schools district to reflect that. John Combs, former uh, arts director explains, Quote, we really want to do is to show the school board and the new superintendent the place of the arts in Missoula are that the fine arts program eventually affects every student K through 12 in Missoula County Public Schools, end quote. Uh, arts programs are far reaching and from the beginning of many kids' uh, entries and continuing throughout their education, it is a mainstay for a lot of kids who have other classes have disconnected from one teacher to the other. Superintendent Michael Hill uh, released a statement which got a lot of people uh, worked up for that meeting that lasted about five and a, uh, five and a half uh, hours. And he was quoted in saying, quote, understandably there have been some advocacy for positions that have been recommended for reduction. I think we can all understand and appreciate the desire to protect positions and programs that we deeply care about, end quote. Superintendent makes roughly about six figures and one of the major issues coming out of the many government programs and more is institution administrations tend to focus 
above individual positions in the process. And of course, I've always noticed that even when it comes to major projects on the horizon, many don't address the staff and education, edu educators that keep the places running. And of course, I'm not fully against admins, but a lot of times they look at the numbers and make decisions that are hard, but don't look always inward. Um, and I've always uh, had this take because of I'm a product of the University of Montana at its low time in the post 2012 where many professors were asked to take early retirements and many administrators kept their position during the former. Um, president of the university who kept a, a pretty good salary was replaced but not removed. Um, this also harkened back to the state of Montana suing counties of Missoula for not upholding constitutional laws for equalization. And so when we go a little bit deeper, equalization was the plan for the state of Montana for the, based on the 50 year plus constitution that was established in the 1970s to essentially um, deviate all public schools money through the state and then each school would be garnished X amount of money so the higher uh, populated schools would be able to help support other schools so a lot of ways they would be able to ev evenly distribute the money and of course this up year the uh, however back in November the Montana Supreme Court voted against uh, a bunch of the counties who wanted to uh, lower the levies for these school districts, which go, went on to create a pool for all public schools to get equal funding across the state, meaning no school is funded more than another per capita. And so there are some questions for further wonder about funds for schools going into this upcoming uh, fiscal year, which will start in July. There are also some interesting contradictions uh, going into MCPS current budget overall. Montana News broke this week as, um, uh, okay, so, I'm gonna move on to my next topic because this is actually some interesting news as news broke this week uh, from the reservations began to plead to Montana and the Fed and the US government who listened about a growing Mexican cartel presence in many of the reservations across Montana. The video uh, has garnished over 1.5 million views in the last five days, highlighting this as the source of the fentanyl crisis, which two years ago NPR article basically highlighted the fact that Browning was doing a major um, issues when it comes to uh, the fentanyl issue happening on the reservation. And the story continues to highlight the day and night difference between the community that has no way of protecting itself from cartel, sowing seeds in their community where police presence tends to be highway patrol, which can span upwards of hundreds of miles. They have tribal leaders, tribal police, and when they asked for um, more money and more help, they actually got the opposite and their tribal police had a reduction as a result. So. Many tribal leaders are certain these drugs flow easily in the community, contributing to the major majority of crimes, which include domestic violence, drug overdoses, which also lead to death. And you know that's just one of the many things that are kind of happening in the state of Montana, as uh, we're not dealing with a lot of snow as well. Um, in, in, in here in Missoula, many other places, especially in the East Coast, are doing some major snowfall problems. You know, that got that Pineapple Express that was in um, California, it had a lot of rains. Missoula and many places, Montana, had a very low percentage in terms of our um, annual precipitation. We did get some snow last night, but there wasn't much with that as well. So I also, uh, let's see. Yeah, the weather is going to get a lot warmer. This weekend is going to get pretty cold, but uh, the weather is going to be in the 40s as we get into Sunday through the next week. So we're going to have a little bit of a warmer spell during this winter time. So you definitely got a lot to look forward to uh, this week as well. And that pretty much does it for my morning show. And I wanted to thank you guys for joining me this morning and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp. Take care, guys.